Hi, ladies. Um, good to be in touch. I'm sorry that we're not um, face to face with one another and that we are doing this via voice recording. But um, it is important to be learning and to get inspiration. And so um, I have prepared a shiur for us today. Um, it's Parshas Vayakel. Vayakel means um, to assemble. Moshe Rabbeinu assembled Bnei Israel, the children of Israel. And um, he told them that they had to do the following. And we'll come back to that in a minute. Um, let's start off with a story that um, I'd like to start off with to give you an idea of looking at something from a different angle and um, responding to things in a different way as versus the usual response and see what we can draw out from that before we continue with our Pasha. The story is about a man, a rabbi, known as Rabbi Emmanuel Gottlieb of Hanover. And he was very well known for his seichel and his cleverness. And one day he encountered some children who had been brought up in a very anti-Semitic environment. And as he walked past them, they started to call out, Itzik Jew, Itzik Jew, trying to taunt him and trying to humiliate him. And this um, Rabbi Gottlieb looked at them and he called them closer and he said, look, I have some candy for you. And he took candies out of his pockets and he said, if you promise to call me um, as loudly as possible tomorrow when I walk past Itzik Jew, then I promise you that I will give you more candies. What do you think? <laughs> of course, the children responded. And the next day, as he walked past, they shouted out at him again, Itzik Jew, Itzik Jew. And he rewarded them with candy. And this went on for several days. Every time he walked past, this daily ritual continued. And one day, as Rabbi Emmanuel Gottlieb walked past and they shouted at him, he turned to them and emptied out his pockets and showed him, look, I'm so sorry, he said solemnly, but I have no more candy for you and I won't be able to provide you with any more. And the disappointed children responded, well, if that's the case, then we are never going to call you Itzik Jew again. And Rabbi Emanuel shrugged his shoulders and replied, well, I'm so sorry, that's too bad. It can't be helped. And with a barely perceptible smile on his face, he continued on his way. I think that's such a clever story. It shows us that there's always two ways to respond to things. So, yes, we're in the throes of a very apocalyptic time. The whole world has changed and all the rules of the world have suddenly changed. Everything's come to a standstill. I don't want to go on about coronavirus. I think everybody's been absolutely inundated with videos and anecdotes and advice. And there's a lot of beautiful and, and inspiring stuff out there. Um, I did come across something which many of you, I think, have come across already, which is that, interestingly, and it does connect with this week's parsha, that the state of Israel, um, this Shabbat, for the first time since its establishment, is going to have everything shut down. There will be no transport. There will be no um, gatherings at beaches, which is not permitted. No bars or restaurants open. No malls. Everything actually is shut down. And though that is not necessarily the choice of the people, but it clearly is the hand of God. And um, there has been a, a WhatsApp going around, which I can also share with our groups, calling on all of B'nai Israel, since we are already at home and since we cannot go to public places, to take this opportunity, this Shabbos, to be with our families. We've been forced to slow down, to spend time together with our loved ones and um, to take the time and take this opportunity to observe Shabbat this week. And who knows what that will please God bring. So how is it connected to this week's parsha? Well, um, Moshe Rabbeinu um, gathered all of the whole community of Bnei Israel. He assembled them, which, mean, which is the word Vayakel, which means to assemble. And interestingly, this was the day after Yom Kippur. 
And he says to them, Sheishesh yamim tase malacha uvayom hashvi'i yye lachem kode shabbat shabbaton la Hashem kol haosevo malacha yumat. He says, these are the things that God commanded to be done. For six days work may be done, but the seventh day should be holy for you, a day of complete rest to God. Whoever does work on it shall be put to death. Okay, so we see that um, just like the hand of God is forcing us to keep Shabbat this week or forcing many things that normally um, many Jews would keep functioning in Eretz Israel, especially on Shabbat this week, there is no choice. They cannot function. And um, Moshe Rabbeinu is calling on B'nai Israel this week, in this week's Parshas Vayakel, to observe the Shabbat. Now we're going to look at these psukim, these verses that I've quoted more um, in depth and try and understand um, the deeper lessons from them. So first of all, um, it says in this verse, for six days work may be done, but the seventh day shall be holy for you. <coughs> and um, <coughs> I did cover my mouth when I was coughing, just as, um, just in case anybody was concerned what might come through your cell phone. Please don't worry. Okay, so um, it brings up the question. One of the greatest paradoxes of life and a life of faith a life where we are supposed to trust in Hashem is, if Hashem is the source of all blessing, if every single thing that we have in our lives comes directly from God Almighty, then why should we work? Why toil to earn a livelihood? And if we are supposed to work, then how should we work? And that is addressed in this week's parsha quite clearly. So first of all, the Torah does tell us, Hashem says that I will bless you in all that you do, which means that we are commanded to put in an effort and to work in order to bring in an income, in order to make a livelihood. However, how do we work is addressed very much in this week's parsha. Because it says, it doesn't say six days shall you work. But the words are specifically six days shall work be done. What does that mean? It means that we are told that the work that we do is supposed to be a passive labor. As our sages put it. What does that mean? It means that... We are supposed to do that which David HaMelech, King David, entreats us to do. What does David say? If you will eat the labor of your hands, you will be happy and it will be well with you. What's David implying? Hasidus teaches us as follows. That when we engage in making a parnasa, in making a livelihood... It should only be with our hands. The activity should be an external activity that we are involved in our work and in bringing in our or involved in the business of the day in an external way. But inwardly, that which our heart and mind is engaged in, that should be with the divine. One's thoughts and feelings should remain bound up with godly things so that it's not our entire being that is involved and preoccupied with materialism and preoccupied with our business and our material concerns. That's not the way of a Jew and that's not the way that we should be involved in trying to make an income. Because what does that denote? It denotes a, a lack of belief and a, lack, and a lack even of understanding that at the end of the day, we are making the vessel and Hashem fills the vessel. And in fact, that is why a Jew works. A Jew works in order to make what we call a keli, a vessel. But we have to keep in mind that it is Hashem 
that fills the vessel. Our business and our um, job or our form of employment is the Kaylee, and we have to make that Kaylee. We do have to work in a natural way, so we can't lie down on the couch and expect miracles. And that's not the way Hashem wants to work in this world. He wants to work in a natural way and fill our vessel. But we have to remember that that is the effort that we put in is what makes the vessel. Hashem fills the vessel. How do we see that? Gosh, it is so clearly illustrated to us in our lives at every turn. In other words, you get one person who studied incredibly hard to become, let's say, a dentist. And you get another person who studied incredibly hard to become a dentist. And they both work in the dental field. One is incredibly successful. One has success and has many, many um, patients who come for dental work and his bank account gets filled. And the other one works as hard and he would like to have many, many patients who come to him. But what happens? Don't know. The seats in the waiting room are empty and there are not many people who visit his dental practice. So... Is it a guarantee that if you put your kids through the best kind of schooling and you um, spend all your money on giving them the best education that they are necessarily going to have the best income? No, the way to look at it is that we do our part. We should have a trade or a um, profession and we should work at it and we should work honestly at it And we should remember that our entire being and our entire focus should not be there. Because then we're cutting Hashem out of the equation. And we are acting as though we are sustained by our own efforts and not through Hashem's blessing. So the Hasidic masters even take this a little bit further. When it says in this week's parasha, Shabbat Shabbaton, okay, that the seventh day should be a Shabbat Shabbaton, which means a day of complete rest for God. What does that mean? Every single phrase and every single word in the Torah has got um, many, many levels of meaning. So Moshe Rabbeinu is telling Bnei Israel that when Shabbat comes, we should have a belief that the work is complete. And that everything that we've had to do during the six days of the week is done. There should be no anxiety that pervades or seeps into Shabbat. And if a person is completely preoccupied with their um, profession or their um, employment during the week, obsessed with it, completely focused with it, thinking they have to work themselves to the bone and their whole heart and mind is involved in it, then you know what? The Torah says when Shabbat arrives, even if our body ceases work, at that time our mind will not be at rest. Our mind will not be at peace because during the week, We have to do that preparation during those six days in order that Shabbat will be a day of rest and that the light of Shabbat will illuminate us and illuminate the Shabbat. That will make it a Shabbat Shabbaton, a Shabbat twice over. And interestingly, and we've learned this before, what is the source of blessing for the coming week, for the coming six days of the week? Shabbat. So the one feeds into the other. The way that we are in the six days of the week will determine our Shabbat and the joy and the light and the Kedusha, the holiness of the Shabbat that we experience. And then that feeds into the rest of the week. And by the way, it doesn't only feed into the income and the success that we have of the rest of the week, but it also feeds into the joy that we experience in the rest of the week, our ability to feel a deep connection with the Almighty in the week, 
and that in itself then affects the next Shabbat. So everything has a knock-on effect and we can start today in order to affect the rest of the week and the Shabbat which will affect the week following. Um, there's another very interesting um, idea that's brought out with this week's Parsha. Because remember, in this week's Parsha, um, we are still involved in the building of the Mishkan. B'nai Israel are told later on as we progress in the Parsha that they should bring donations for the building of the Mishkan, which is the temple that um, they could transport while they were in the Midbar in the desert. And this temple, interestingly, atoned for and rectified for the sin of the golden calf. Now, there is a, um, a comparison that we can make here, actually. And we can bring a, um, what's the word? We can bring how there is um, not just a comparison, but a difference that we can focus on between the Mishkan and the golden calf. Because both of them require material things in order for them to be built. The golden calf was a deification of the material, of this, um, this gold that was brought by the people um, and yeah, of this specific material, whereas the everything that was brought for the Mishkan was a subjugation of the material to serve the divine. And we see that that also is something that we can learn with regards to how we work in the week. Why did B'nai Israel begin, or why did idolatry begin? Idolatry began because people started to see that the sun, moon, and the stars were actually channels through which God worked in order to bring mazal, in order to bring um, nourishment to the earth. So what did the people do? In error, instead of seeing that they were the vessels through which God works in the world, they started to see them as the source of blessing. So we know that through the stars, there are certain mazalos. There's a certain flow, that, right? The way that we translate mazal um, directly means flow. There's a, a mazalos that comes into the world through the stars, through the constellations, through the sun and the moon. However, they are simply channels. That is simply what we call um, the vessels through which Hashem's flow comes to the world. So the mistake of people and even of B'nai Israel at one stage was to believe that through that these actual um, constellations and these entities had a power of their own. And so they started to worship them and left out the source which is above them, which is Hashem. And that was a grave mistake, and that is idolatry. And in fact, I heard Rabbi Mendel Kaplan explaining something very interesting with regards to the sin of the golden calf, which was last week's parsha. And that is that, um, why did B'nai Israel, why were they given over to worshipping a calf? So remember, the Erev Rav, which was a whole lot of Egyptians that saw the hand of God at the time of the Exodus and before that even with the ten plagues and said to Moshe Rabbeinu, let us join you. Let us convert and let us join you and leave Mitzrayim with you. And Moshe allowed them to. but And they were huge in number. And unfortunately, they brought a lot of trouble to B'nai Israel. And when the B'nai Israel calculated wrongly that Moshe Rabbeinu was supposed to return from going up Har Sinai. They calculated wrongly and believed that he was not going to return. So then the Erev Rav turned to the rest of B'nai Israel, to the B'nai Israel and said, look, you said that 
There's no such power in the constellations. But the Mitzrayim had actually worshipped the constellations and specifically Aries, which is why we know they worshipped a, a, a sheep. And one of the reasons why we had to bring the Korban Pesach, the, um, which is the, um, the, the sacrifice of the sheep before we left Mitzrayim, was to show we're slaughtering this deity of the Mitzrayim and we are breaking away from their idol worship because unfortunately it had also seeped into the ways of B'nai Israel. But now the the Erev Rav said to B'nai Israel, you said that this sheep and this constellation has no power. But you know what? That God is the only power. But you know what really happened? Look, Moshe Rabbeinu isn't coming back. So there must be something wrong with your calculations. They said, we've calculated. You know why you were able to leave Mitzrayim? Because Taurus overcame Aries. And therefore, you know what's really in power now? A cow, the bull, Taurus. And they were able to convince them through that to create a calf, a golden calf. This is one of the teachings of the, um, the Rebbe Maharash in a whole mimer. And unfortunately, Bnei Israel believed them. And so it was only the men, by the way, not the righteous woman who got involved in this and gave of their gold and jewelry for the construction of this terrible deity, which was the golden calf. So the Mishkan was the antidote to this. And that is what um, Moshe Rabbeinu has asked the people to donate to in this week's parsha. And by the way, the woman went and gave and gave in abundance and the men kind of lagged behind. So they managed to kind of almost keep up with the woman. But the woman were incredibly righteous and incredibly enthusiastic to serve Hashem and rectify, make this rectification now and um, donate to the Mishkan. So in to go back to our original thought, if people think that their channel, which is their um, profession or their um, job or their means of employment, if they think that that actually is what's bringing their um, blessing to them and bringing in the parnasa and bringing in their income, then it's a form of idolatry. And we learn from this week's parsha that the way to rectify that is through Shabbat and keeping Shabbat in a way where we understand that six days shall work be done, but on the seventh day it will be a holy day. Understanding that we cannot put our entire being and entire focus into the six days of work in the week, but that our minds and hearts should be focused on high, should be looking for how to serve Hashem and should always be meditating on Hashem. And with our hands, we do our work and we know that all the source of brocha and all the source of blessing is from Hashem, is from God Almighty alone. And in this way, we actually atone for the idolatry of the world. Um, and it's a correction for the instinct of the idolatry, which we understand that today the worship of money and the worship of the need for um, having materialism and, and filling our bank accounts and putting our entire selves, that is a form of idolatry. Um, okay, so um, it's not going to be a shiur as long as the ones that we normally have in the week. However, um, I do want to end with a story because um, we need to understand that God also works through other channels in this world and those are the tzaddikim. And we are supposed to have imunas tzaddikim, um, faith in tzaddikim, but as we know, 
Hashem is still the source that works through his channels, which are the tzaddikim. Why are tzaddikim able to pass on brocha and the word of God and guidance and be Hashem's servants to such a degree? Because they completely sublimate their will to the will of God. So that the will of a tzaddik and a will of Hashem become one. The tzaddik's only will is the will of Hashem. So here's a beautiful um, story that illustrates how that, that is the case and how we, um, we should attach ourselves to tzaddikim so that we can serve God. And that needs to be our goal. And that's what um, tzaddikim desire, that we should m- serve Hashem um, as completely and as beautifully as we possibly can. Um, and at this time specifically, we do need to take on extra acts of Kedusha so that we bring Hashem's light and healing into the world. So let's end with our story. The story is um, about a chassid of the Lubavitch Rebbe who um, had a little girl who was 10 years old. And unfortunately, her development was very, very slow. So that she um, spoke and behaved in the world very much like a four-year-old. And of course, this poor father was heartbroken about it. He was so sad. So he, um, he wrote many letters to the Rebbe, and he didn't seem to get a reply. And so he decided to go directly to 770 himself. And when he was there, he spoke to the Rebbe's secretaries, specifically to uh, Rabbi Label Groner, and he told him, I'm not leaving here until I get the Rebbe's answer. And he wrote more letters to the Rebbe, another letter to the Rebbe, and the secretary took it in and came back with the response. The Rebbe says, what's with the mezuzahs in your house? And the chassid was absolutely shocked. His face turned pale. Could it be that some of the mezuzahs in his home were possible, were not kosher? And he understood how also the mezuzah is a channel for blessing, whether we're in our home or outside of our home. So he went home and he took off all his mezuzahs and he took them to the best sofa that he knew. And the sofa checked all of his mezuzahs and came back to him and said, each and every one is kasher le mahadrin, completely kosher, like to the highest standard. So he put up all his mezuzahs again and he went back to ask the Rebbe secretary and to pass on that message. And the secretary came back. Um, the Chassid wrote another letter to the Rebbe to inform him of what was happening. And the secretary came back and said, the Rebbe is saying, what's with the mezuzahs in your house? And the Chassid couldn't believe it. And um, painstakingly, and with a lot of commitment, he got all his mezuzahs checked again. And he was told, they are absolutely kosher. So this man went back again, and he told the secretary, they're all kosher. Please, please ask the Rebbe, like, what does he mean? So the secretary went back in, and he came back, and he says, the Rebbe is saying, what with the mezuzah in your house that is missing so the the chassid thought there could be a door post in my house that doesn't have a mezuzah is it possible couldn't believe it so he went to his house and he checked every single room that every single door post of every single room should have a mezuzah and he got to the last room which was used as a storeroom wasn't used much except that the children often went in there to play and he sees this room has no mezuzah he was shocked and he thought to himself how did the rabbi know my daughter often spends time in this room and so he went to buy a mezuzah and he put it up and um The story goes that Baruch Hashem, within a few months, his daughter's development had accelerated very quickly so that you couldn't tell the difference in um, stage between her and another 10-year-old girl of the same age as her. Um, Yeah, we should focus on Kedusha now. Most people don't really have much choice. 
Uh, many people are housebound, and I've saw, I've seen some beautiful posts about how um, we are being forced to slow down to spend time with our loved ones. Um, if people are in quarantine, then uh, thank God we're in South Africa. If we have gardens, we could each sit on another uh, opposite end of the garden. Um, or we can just sit and talk through the door because there's no school, um, there are very few gatherings, there pro probably won't even be shul this week. And so we're forced to slow down and really talk to the people we love. And um, if, there anybody, if there's anybody who know is lonely, please give them a call, ask them if you can shop for them. Um, we have to reach out now and focus on Havas Israel and Kedusha, our mezuzahs, our tefillahs, um, and all the things that we're going to have time to do now. Okay, may it be um, that we have abundant, abundant rachamim, Hashem's kindness and mercy from on high, and that we indeed see the blessing that will come out from this time.